Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Alex Kyrios. I am the senior editor responsible for the Dewey Decimal Classification. I work for OCLC. Um, typically, I am working out of the Library of Congress, which I'll mention later on why that is. Um, coming to you from my, my home in Washington, D.C. today because I have not been in much since the, since the pandemic. Um, I've been in this position for a little over six years, and before that I was a cataloger at the University of Idaho and the Folger Shakespeare Library, um, in both of which I mostly used Library of Congress classification, but um, I, I had a lot more Dewey experience before then. Um, as mentioned in the description for today's event, if you already have access to Web Dewey through your institution, um, you should probably use that. There will be a few places where you might want to follow along when I demonstrate Web Dewey. And later on, we'll be building some numbers, getting kind of hands on in Web Dewey. Um, so if you don't already have access on your own, uh, these three accounts can be used um, throughout today, perhaps into tomorrow. Um, they should be all right with simultaneous users, but um, to prevent you know, having everyone on one, um, I have suggested here that based on the first letter of your last name, you, you choose one of these three, um, but they all should work. I did a little bit of testing um, and found that at least two people can use these simultaneously with, with no problems, but I only have so many arms, so I was not able to test, test larger numbers. Um, when we get to WebDewe, I'll, I'll note a few things that might get tricky with simultaneous users, but uh, hopefully everything will will go smoothly there. Um, these these passwords, these um, you know very secure <laughs> passwords, Dewey two hundred and so on, are case sensitive. Um, the usernames, though, these uh, strings of numbers, you can include the hyphens or not. They are um, kind of like punctuation in phone numbers. That's really there for for human benefit, but you can enter them or not, and, and those should work. Uh, so today's training is roughly in three parts. I will start with an overview of the DDC itself, um, start to talk about some of the practical elements of how to use it, and then hopefully we should have plenty of time to talk about the process of number building and get some hands-on experience with that. Um, my plan is to have 10, 10 minute breaks to stretch, get coffee, whatever you'd like to do at the end of the first and second section. Um, I'm a Dewey editor. I would have loved if these were in nice, even thirds, um, you know, like a game of hockey or something, but they're, they're not quite. I think the third part will be, um, be a little longer, um, but we'll take about 10 minutes between them anyway. Um, those times between the sessions are going to be um, very convenient times for questions, but especially if, I'm, if I've lost you somewhere in the process, um, I'll sort of leave it to the moderators. Um, feel free to sort of jump in um, and jump in with a question if you need to. Um, it'll be a little hard for me to very actively monitor the chat while presenting, but um, I don't mind if you need to, to ask me to hold on for a minute. All right, so this uh, first section might be might be a review for some of you, but won't be too long before we get into to more advanced stuff. Right. Um, the Dewey Decimal Classification was first published by Melville Dewey in 1876. Um, it was never meant to be a, a static system. Dewey himself published several more editions in his lifetime. Beginning in 1911, the DDC was published by a company called Forest Press, which Dewey founded. Um, even though the Library of Congress has its own classification system, uh, it has been involved in the Dewey editor editorial process for a long time, since 1927. Um, since most public libraries in the US use DDC, there are Library of Congress employees who assign DDC numbers uh, for the benefit of public libraries, such as yours, in the US. 
Um, although, of course, because it's a you know U.S. government work, people around the world get to benefit from it without without copyright or anything. In normal times, I work closely with those Library of Congress employees who assign those Dewey numbers. They can let me know if um, you know there's emerging topics that don't get represented very well. Um, so it's it's a good relationship. In 1988, OCLC acquired Forest Press and the sort of intellectual rights to the DDC, um, and so has been responsible for publishing and maintaining DDC ever since. Um, but you know, I'm still here in DC. Um, in 2011, OCLC published the 23rd edition of the DDC. Uh, your library might have these these lovely orange books around. That's what the 23rd edition looked like. This was the last full printed edition of the DDC, but it that does not mean that the work is over. Since 2011, the system has continuously been revised via WebDewey. Uh, I realize this, this first bullet point is a little misleading. WebDewey is older than 2011. Um, that's just sort of when the switchover happened that it's the, the sort of one-stop shop now. Um, Hopefully many of you already use WebDewey and we'll, we'll take a, a much closer look at it uh, later this morning. Um, for many years after the publication of one of these print editions, uh, the editors would prepare an abridged edition, which um, compresses the whole classification from these four volumes down to one, um, primarily intended for small libraries, other ones with um, smaller collections. Uh, the last of those was based on the 23rd edition and published in 2012. Um, while there is no longer a separate abridged edition, WebDewey does give you the ability to um, view marks of where to cut those off if you used abridged classification. And we'll, we will take a look at that later as well. Um, we do also make a sort of print on demand version available that is essentially a kind of screenshot of um, or a snapshot rather of web Dewey data that's um, sort of taken once per year. Um, so if you want a printed edition around to to refer to, I know that can be be helpful sometimes. Um, it's not exactly that, you know, there's no print ever again, um, just that we're not coming out every seven years and saying, Here's the totally new Dewey. Uh, Web Dewey is such a powerful tool because it goes beyond what was even in these full printed editions. Um, there are thousands of built numbers, history notes, additional index terms that just wouldn't fit in print. We were already looking at four pretty heavy full full volumes, and there were there were trade offs that had to be made just because print means limited space, which is not a concern in Web Dewey. Um, all right. Um, DDC has also been translated into many languages. Um, depending on how you count and what you count as current, there are about eight or nine current translations, um, usually of either the most, um, the, le the last abridged edition or, or a full one. And most of those have dedicated translation teams that Anytime I update something in English, they make the change in the, the translation as well. And um, I, I work closely with them. They help sort of flag things for, you know, what does this mean for, um, you know, for our country where, where this is being used. Uh, so onto the structure of the DDC itself. Um, I've kind of broken this down into three main elements of the whole DDC. Um, the schedules, the tables, and the manual. Um, the schedules are divided into 10 main classes, um, just kind of denoted by the first digit of any, any given number. Each division has 10, or <laughs> each main class has 10 divisions, and each division has 10 sections for a total of those 1,000 three-digit numbers that make up the, kind of the basic skeleton of the, the DDC. Um, there are certainly many much longer numbers than, than three, and some three-digit numbers that, that we don't actually use, but I see them as part of that structure. Um, the tables give notation that can be added to 
different numbers in the number building process. Um, the manual gives longer notes on the usage of particular numbers and notes that wouldn't fit very well at just one number. You know, if we're giving detailed explanation of when do you use this number versus that number, easier to, to put it in one place in the manual and then have notes telling you to go check that. Um, while it is not part of the DDC in quite the same way, I also want to put it in a good word for the introduction. Um, I'll have I'll have a link to this in later slides, but it is just um, oc.lc slash DDC dash intro, all lowercase. Um, in print, it's where you would expect at the beginning of volume one. It's also available at a as a linked PDF from Web Dewey at that URL I just mentioned. So I don't know about you, when I'm reading a book and I see something labeled introduction, there's a pretty good chance I'm either just going to skim that or just skip over it entirely. Um, don't do that here. The, the introduction has some um, core rules and very helpful examples that really are, are worth reading in full, um, even if a few sections really are introductory telling you about you know, when the DDC began, things like that. Um, what, one of these days, I would like to find a better term for that than, than the introduction that really tells you, you should read me. So, um, coming off that, that little soapbox. Uh, so these probably look familiar if you have ever used Web Dewey. Uh, yeah, good. Thank you for that intro link. Um, you can see the, the 10 main classes numbered 0 through 9 as well as the, the six tables. Um, you can see there's really technically kind of eight tables because table three is in, in several parts, uh, which that is what it is. We, that's just how we call them. Table notation is never used alone, but is um, used in the number building process. Classification in the DDC is based on discipline. Um, that's not necessarily unique to the DDC. I think this is kind of true of many um, classification systems that it's not necessarily enough to know what the, the subject of a work is. You need to know the kind of context in which it's being treated. For example, a work on environmentalism could end up with economics, political science, philosophy, and so on. Uh, we, and we will, we will explore that. Um, in, in further detail soon. Um, I also wanted to just give you a, a sense of what the, the update process is, is like now that we are 10 years out from the last kind of full printed edition. Um, my job in a nutshell is to continuously revive and <laughs> revise and improve the DDC. Um, I'm not a salesman. If you're still using printed DDC 23 and it's meeting your needs, um, that's good. Um, but the classification has changed a lot since then. What's printed on those pages, you know, has not. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a decision to make make for your own library. And again, there's never been a time when the DDC was was totally static. But in the pre-computer days, changes between those printed editions were, were pretty rare. Um, the DDC has been available in an electronic form of one type or another since 1993. Um, so for a while, there was kind of a mix of um, immediate changes and those that were just, whenever they were completed, they were kind of being held off for the next full printed edition. Um, after 2011, we kind of realized it didn't make sense to to kind of hold on to things for years like that, and that was part of the the shift towards the sort of continuous revision model that, that we see in Web Dewey. Um, Web Dewey also has a, a feature that I'll show off that um, will sh can show you all updates in a certain area or over a certain period of time, so um, that makes it easier to to kind of track changes. So. These days, um, sometimes I'm working on my own proposals for, for changing Dewey, um, generally because someone has, has requested it, um, because I've heard a need and not just something looks fun, although I, I, do, I do enjoy what I do. Um, 
But just because I'm the editor doesn't mean I'm the only one who can, can make such proposals. Um, especially in the last several years, we've really um, tried to open up this process so anyone can get involved in, um, in making these changes, whether they're typically they're going to be at a, a do using institution, but it can be um, you know, subject matter experts, anyone else kind of interested in this. Um, I say proposal. It's not that I can't make the changes on my own, um, but I, I might get into trouble if I did too much of that on my own, um, because all major proposals for revising the DDC go through a group called the Editorial Policy Committee, or EPC. Um, the EPC is a group of 10 representative DEWEY users from around the world. Um, it's organized jointly by OCLC and ALA. Um, they're, so these are not OCLC employees, they're just chosen um, by a combination of, of ALA and OCLC. Um, ALA understands, you know, despite American, that we want the DDC to be a global system, so um, there is representation from uh, currently six countries. There were earlier groups that did similar work, but the, the EPC as we know it dates to, to 1953. In normal times, EPC meets in person about once a year with uh, one or two electronic meetings in between where smaller issues are discussed. Um, due to the pandemic, of course, the last face-to-face -face meeting was in 2019, um, and we've had more electronic meetings than usual in between. Um, I hope there, it'll be safe to have a face-to-face -face meeting in 2022, but everything's more complicated with an international group like this. Um, for those outside the US, I want them to not be able to get to the meeting safely, but also get home and not have to quarantine for two weeks or something like that. Um, you can also get a sense when you see these countries that um, time zones being what they are, it's, it's difficult to get a time that all of these people can, you know, even for an hour or so discuss, um, you know, in a Zoom meeting or something like that. Uh, we've tried our best, but I don't think we've ever gotten all 10 at once. Um, Australia in particular, it's, it's tough to work around Australian time. At EPC meetings, uh, the members vote on proposals, whether those are written by me or do we volunteers worldwide. Um, if they don't accept a proposal, it's generally sent back with some comments for, um, for potential revision rather than kind of rejecting them outright. Um, it's a good group. They're good at considering uh, what proposals will mean for institutions like them, for their countries. Um, they often sort of share those out with, with colleagues for further feedback. Um, all right, not, not every change to the DDC goes, goes through the, the, the um, EPC necessarily. Um, there's, there's research involved, but part of that is figuring out, um, you know, does this need to be formally written up for them to consider, or is this just, you know, changing little things? Um, asking how long it takes to, to come up with one of these is kind of like asking how long it takes to catalog one book. It really depends. Some of it is straightforward. Um, some of it can, can get pretty involved. We try to consult with a lot of um, outside kind of subject matter experts, um, whether the, they're librarians or not. Um, and I then just kind of work with a, a group of interested volunteers to sort of um, do some back and forth with these proposals um, and kind of sharpen them up before, before they're sent to EPC. Um, again, not every, Everything we do cut, rises to that level of going through EPC. Um, the smallest changes we, we call editorial malarkey. That can be, you know, a typo or, oh, we have this type of note, but it's supposed to be that type of note. Some of those little things I just do on my own. Um, for changes, a little, a little more than that, but are still fairly obvious. Sometimes I'll make the change and then let EPC know after the fact. They can take a look, and if they think I've made a mistake, they'll let me know. Um, for things that affect maybe more numbers, but we still think it's pretty straightforward, we might propose them on the, 
to the EPC on their listserv. And if no one says anything after three days, which they usually don't, we go ahead and, and publish them. Um, beyond that, it goes to, goes to them for consideration at their meetings. Um, it is not a, a scary group. Um, they're, they're easy to work with. Um, they know that um, you know, different libraries have different needs. Sometimes we need to you know, tweak this process a little bit. Um, for example, when we got a, a proposal from a volunteer for a number for COVID-19, we kind of fast-tracked that um, you know, rather than, than waiting for the next meeting. We knew there was a, um, a need for, for a number on that. Um, so one of the best things about my job is getting to work with those Dewey users worldwide to, to help improve the DDC. Um, this is a way of helping make sure that um, you know, we're making changes that are, are important to users. Um, there's, there's kind of no end to little tweaks I can make here or there, but um, I want to help sort of focus, focus efforts on, on places that are really going to, to make a difference. Um, working with different people also just means people bring diverse perspectives, experience that um, that you know might not be represented in the DDC so far. That's something we're really trying to prioritize, um, you know, especially recently. Um, the translators are a, a big part of this as well. That um, they can help flag if something is, you know, maybe fine for the U.S. but makes no sense to them. Or um, sometimes interesting interesting things come up when they they try to translate something that. Um, that doesn't necessarily translate well. Um, there's a couple links here, which um, you know you'll be able to, to refer to later on. But um, since uh, 2018 or so, we've um, started public publicly publishing these um, proposals that the EPC considers, and we also have a page of um, kind of how you can get involved if, if you're interested in doing so. Um, you're also welcome to always just email me and say, hey, why don't you have a number for this? Um, I might have an answer for you and I might add it to my to-do list. Uh, all right, it is, we're still uh, a little early on time here, but um, I think this is going to be a, a good time for a, a first break, again, with uh, kind of one more break later on. Um, where we'll get into much more detail about practical usage of the DDC. Um, if you also want to, to leave any questions for me um, from this first part here, um, or, or anything, I, I might well answer, oh, we'll get to that soon. Um, but let's see, it is, it is 11.06 for me, so 10.06 for me. Um, to keep it simple, let's just say, um, well, it just became seven. Uh, let's, yeah, let's reconvene in, in 10 minutes. Um, I can go through any questions that you leave in the, the chat um, before we start um, getting practical. So. Um. All right, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, hope you have something some, some good caffeine or something. Um, all right, uh, I've got, I see a couple of questions in the chat, so um, I'll sort of address those before we move on. Uh, I have a question. Brian asks how members of EPC are selected. Um, there are, there's just kind of a few reserved seats. Um, the Library of Congress gets a sort of permanent representative. Um, ALA names uh, selects three, and that kind of comes through um, core now. It used to be Alex. Um, they kind of just give OCLC nominations. I don't necessarily know how they, they choose them. Um, OCLC names, names four people. Um, there's a permanent representative from the um, UK DDC user forum, the sort of user group in the United Kingdom. Um, relatively new, there is a, also a European Dewey users group 
Um, the UK is involved with that, but that's mostly kind of continental Europe. Um, I think I was surprised when I started in this position to learn that um, a lot of national libraries and universities even in, the, in Europe use DDC. Um, <clears throat> I think I was, you know, used to, used to the US situation where it's, oh, school libraries and publics use Dewey, colleges use, use LC. And for me, at least thinking back to, you know, to library school and so on, I think I had this idea that like, oh, Dewey's the simple system and then LC is complicated. Um, when in reality, they're both complicated. <laughs> um, as we'll see, you can get to some really sort of granular things um, in Dewey, but um, anyway, that, that gets a little bit away from the question, but um, yeah, a few reserved seats and then ALA and OCLC can kind of choose however we want. Um, some of those countries that don't have um, dedicated seats necessarily, like Canada, Australia, South Africa, uh, we traditionally try to pick someone, someone from there. Um, OCLC can pick people from the U.S., but um, I think especially with you know with ALA having a few dedicated seats, um, OCLC picks are often sort of used to help um, help make sure there's there's geographic diversity. Uh, also have a question on guidance on where to class materials on COVID-19. Um, I have made a note of that. We'll definitely get to that later and it, it'll provide some, some good examples of some of the stuff that we're about to go over. So um, promise you we'll get to that one. That's that's a definitely a good question. I'm sure at this point you're you're all starting to see kind of materials on those. All right then. Um, Again, moderators can can feel free to to let me know if there's anything um, kind of urgent, and um, there will be other other questions where other points in the the presentation where I'll just sort of open it up to to any questions. Now that we've had a sort of brief history and quick overview of the um, present of the DDC, let's talk about kind of how to actually use it. Um, I assume most or all of you, if you know, if a patron asked, could explain the basic idea. There's numbers. The numbers mean you know different kind of subject areas. The numbers get applied to to works based based on that subject area. Um, the basic idea is you know when classifying is to find the right number for for whatever resource you're cataloging. Sometimes that's easy. Other other times not so much. Um, there are lots of notes throughout the DDC that can, can help guide you, as well as some, some basic rules, rules of thumb, and kind of overall guidelines uh, that you can fall back on when there's not specific guidance. I mentioned the DDC being a discipline-based um, based classification. Still, the first step is usually just going to determine the subject of a work. What's it about? If someone asked you, you know, hey, what's this book about? What would you tell them? Again, that, and that's this isn't really unique to the DDC, but once you know the subject, um, where it will belong in the classification is going to matter um, a lot on the the discipline from which the author is is approaching it. Um, most subjects can be and are studied across multiple disciplines. Um, for example, say you had a book about clothing, and I just told you that much. Is that enough to know what Dewey number you can give it? You might have some idea, but you, you really are going to need more information, namely the discipline to be sure. Um, usually the best way I, I try to get a sense of the disciplinary coverage of a specific subject um, is to consult the index that can either be Volume four in the print or in Web Dewey. Um, this works really well in Web Dewey if you browse the index that gives you some of that kind of print view. Um, before you move on to that, and I'll show you a, an example of a, a Web Dewey browse, um, I wanted to also say something about the idea of a, the form of a, an item. Um, it's understandable you know, to think of the DDC as a, a system for books. That was kind of the general idea. Um, 
you know, being that the system is, is older than, than some of the forms of materials that, that you may collect now. Um, because of that, it, it's, any number could potentially have all sorts of different types of materials. Um, it, in, as a practical matter, you know, a lot of comics and graphic novels class in 741.5, um, that's a, a drawing number. Um, even though they're, they're really examples of drawing rather than being about that. There's also specific numbers for kind of sound recordings or films, um, but those, those don't necessarily kind of trump these other considerations. Um, if you have a nonfiction graphic novel or a documentary film, in pure DDC, we would say, oh, just put that at whatever, you know, whatever it's about. Um, you know, we also have a number 002, the book. No one's putting every book at that number. Um, but um, we'll, we'll talk a little more about um, kind of local practices. Um, don't worry if you don't have all your graphic novels at, at 741.5. So back to the idea of discipline. Um, here is an example of a browse in Web Dewey on the in the relative index. I uh, just browsed on the term clothing. Um, you can see there are a lot of disciplines here sort of marked by the, the subheading. I even cut this one a little bit so it would fit on one slide. Some of these, as you can see, are, are fairly specialized. The last entry on this screen is specifically for providing clothing for the needy. Uh, the one directly above that, psychological influence of clothing, it, that sounds really interesting, um, but it's probably not going to come up much. So some of the major major ones here for clothing include um, customs, a uh, little, little above the middle here at 391, um, cultural aspects of clothing. Uh, we got home economics or commercial manufacturing for the creation of clothing. And I also especially want to draw attention here to the topmost entry that is just plain clothing. Um, you might notice that this one is indexed to the same number as the customs entry. That's because for, for the subject of clothing, um, the customs number is what we call the interdisciplinary number for clothing, which is something we'll revisit shortly. Um, I think that, but I think the idea, the name interdisciplinary number kind of communicates the general idea. If a work is looking at the subject of clothing from multiple disciplines, if you had something that's, you know, kind of a complete history of clothing, looking at how different cultures use it, how it's made, et cetera, um, 391 is probably a good place for it. Um, one common criticism I hear about the DDC is that we, we split subjects. And you can see that kind of here. If someone came into your library and said, I want all the works on clothing, there's not a single number that you could point them to um, that would, would satisfy them. But I hope you can see the logic of, of the approach that we've taken. If someone wants to work on how to sew clothing at home and the idea is maybe even if they're seeking a specific book, we want the nearby books to be um, you know, potentially of interest to them. So if someone wants to sew clothing at home, they're probably more interested in kind of other sewing projects than say the significance of clothing in military science. If they wanna read about, you know, effective provision of clothing to needy people, um, other works on helping the needy are probably going to be more relevant than commercial manufacturing of clothing. It's also just the nature of the beast that any system that wants to give, you know, a single numeric code to an item is going to have to make some trade-offs. If I wanted to rearrange things so all works on clothing really were together, other similar subjects would, would kind of get split. Um, as an aside, it is possible in MARC records to assign multiple DDC numbers to the same work. Um, the MARC fields are, are repeatable. Um, some libraries do, do make use of that, um, but the, the notes and the rules of the DDC are designed with the assumption that there is one best number for any given work. So, and it, especially if you're using DDC for shelf listing, just positions of, of items on the books, uh, items on the shelves, 
seems obvious, but um, there are other uses for the DDC, like in bibliographies. Um, you're either going to need to come up with one place on the shelves to put it, or you know, have a lot of dummy items, or hope that you have a lot of copies of a of a publication so you can put it in different places. Once you've determined the subject and the discipline of a book, you might still find yourself with kind of multiple numbers that feel like they fit. So here are four general rules that help you choose the best one. Um, these can all be found in the, the glossary, which is kind of linked from um, the bottom of WebDewey. Um, if you're using one of the temporary authorizations, it might not be there, but if you, if you just Google Dewey glossary, it's part of the, the kind of OCLC help pages, so uh, it shouldn't be too hard to find. These are also treated in the, the introduction, which is um, linked previously in the chat. Um, before I talk about these, I should note that the specific overrides the general. Um, if a specific instruction in the, in the schedules tells you to do one thing that kind of conflicts with one of these, go with the specific. Um, there's plenty of notes like that throughout, such as a um, table of preference, which lists kind of all numbers in an area and says, you know, which ones to prefer if you're considering multiples. So going through this list, the uh, rule of application says that when you have one work that is discussing the influence or effect of one subject on another, um, you class it with the subject being affected. Um, comes up a lot in literature. We use the example of you know, Shakespeare's influence on a later author. Uh, work like that would class with the, the works of the later author, but it's not necessarily limited to literature. Um, the first of two rule, very bread and butter stuff. When you have a work um, that is discussing two numbers, hopefully two numbers kind of close by, um, choose the one that comes first. Um, the, the rule of three, I know LCSH has a, a similar idea of a rule of three. Um, if you're treating three or more subjects and the, the work is giving them kind of equal weight, go up to the kind of lowest number you can find that treats all of them. So a work on the history of Illinois and Iowa and Missouri doesn't favor any one of those states, uh, would class with a history of the Midwest. Um, the rule of zero, I think, is kind of the most technical of these, but it's still important enough that I think it's worth noting. Um, if you're choosing between two numbers kind of in the, in the same area, two subdivisions of the same place, um, avoid one that starts with a zero if one of the alternatives does not. Um, Likewise, if you have a couple zeros, you know, prefer a single zero over two or more. Um, since zeros become come first in the schedules, this is kind of like an exception to the first of two. It's first of two rule. Um, all of this said, if if you have a work that's that's you know predominantly about one thing, these rules might not really matter. Um, a history of Illinois classes with the history of Illinois, even if there's you know small amount of discussion about kind of neighboring states. Um, use an example closer to home for me. If you have a history of Virginia that goes back to the beginning, including parts of what's now West Virginia or Kentucky, that can still class with Virginia. Um, I'm using geographic examples here because they have you know nice clear boundaries that we can refer to. But again, these are not specific to to geography. Um, if you go over into, you know, astronomy, if you have something that treats planetary rings, gravitation, and stars all in kind of equal parts, it can just go to the general number for, for astronomy. Um, this slide shows not the only types of notes that you'll see in the DDC, but some of the most common and some of the most important uh, when it comes to choosing the best number for a work. And I've separated them into kind of two main clusters. Uh, the first shows note, notes that tell you to, to class a subject at the number where you are, where you have found the note, and the notes that tell you to, to check somewhere else. 
I think all five of these notes do a, a pretty good job of getting their intent across in plain English. Um, you know, the first two saying here, the others saying somewhere else. Um, the, the choice of the note is not arbitrary on our part, though. There are some kind of nuances to those. I won't go into to full detail on all of that today, um, but I'll sort of briefly describe them to give you a, a sense of what, what I mean. Um, notes in a class here note are typically close to being just synonyms for whatever the number represents, um, or close enough that we as, the, as an editor think, um, you know, we're probably never going to give this a separate number. Um, an example of this is the number for fishes, 597. Um, one of the topics in the class here note there is bony fishes. Almost all living fish are part of the bony fishes. Um, so the idea of giving a separate number for, for bony fish within fishes, you know, we'd be kind of splitting too many materials there. Um, on the, on the opposite side, an including note lists topics that are in what we call standing room. Um, usually these are a smaller aspect of one number that they're found at, um, but a topic in an including note, that's usually a flag that um, we think maybe one day this would have its own number. In the second group, um, C references are anything that start with the word for, so for topic C number. Uh, when you see a C reference, we're trying to say that this topic logically belongs where you are now, but we've put it elsewhere, um, often because we've kind of just run out of room with the numbers there. Um, for example, at 410, the number for linguistics, there's a C reference for sociolinguistics. Um, logically, that's a, a subtopic of linguistics, but we the number for sociolinguistics is in a completely different area in the 300s social science. Um, class elsewhere note is kind of just other topics that are kind of related um, that we want to make sure you don't miss, but um, don't necessarily have a, a more clearly defined subject. And a C also is usually kind of more tenuous connections. It might be just potential mistakes, like, oh, don't confuse this with this. Um, could be used for homophones for, for terms that you know, sound the same and thus you know, might get confused. Uh, there are interdisciplinary numbers, like we saw for clothing. Um, sometimes these are called ID numbers for short. Um, they're designated for many subjects, although not all. Um, as we saw with clothing, the relative index help, helps make this clear. Anytime that you see a term with, with no further subdivision, um, that's your, your cue that that's the interdisciplinary number. Um, sometimes the notes will, will make this explicit too. Um, so this, the box here at the bottom comes from the, um, from 391 for clothing, um, and you can see uh, class here, interdisciplinary works on costume, clothing, and so on. Um, an interdisciplinary number is not quite the same thing as saying, oh, just put it here if you're in doubt. Um, it's not necessarily a bad idea if you're um, kind of struggling with where to put something. Just make sure you still think about what fits fits best for your work at hand um, and not just letting the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary number, you know, suck up things like a black hole. Um, you shouldn't use them if they're not a logical place for, for what you have. So if you have a work on several aspects of clothing, but it's really all kind of focused on um, making clothing, um, either at home or in the manufacturing, um, it's best to, to head over to, um, to a different area and kind of let the other rules like the first of two rule be your guide. Um, a similar concept to that of an interdisciplinary number is a comprehensive number. Comprehensive numbers are similar, but they're limited to a specific discipline. So for example, the number for baking bread, 641.815, as a note, class here, comprehensive works on baked goods. Um, that note still applies to the discipline of cooking. Um, so if you had something on you know, how to sell baked goods, that might still go somewhere else. Um, but, but 
lets you know that in that case you can use um, the number for either bread and other baked goods, you know, not just bread. Uh, by its nature, the DDC is a hierarchical system. Um, I probably should have cut this out, but I'm realizing you can kind of ignore the, the boxes on the far right side here that say notes and create built number. Um, so every topic in the DDC, unless you're at one of the very top main classes, um, has a, a super category, a parent, a broader class, you know, all of these terms kind of apply. Um, and then most have at least one um, many times more subcategories, childs, <laughs> children, narrower classes, whatever term you want to use. Um, in many cases, topics are kind of defined by their position in the hierarchy. Some types of notes, um, like the ones I've listed here, have what is called hierarchical force, meaning they apply not just at the number where they're found, but also throughout the downward hierarchy and the subcategories um, of that same note. Um, section seven of the introduction gets into more detail on this with a, and it has a fuller listing of notes that, that have hierarchical force. Um, I mostly use WebDUI and our internal database, which is in, in MARC format, but similar to, to WebDUI in my day-to-day -day -to -day work. Um, but I like having a print copy nearby too. There's, there's advantages to, to both print and electronic. Um, I admit that note, notes with hierarchical force are, are easier to process and print because you're just looking probably up on the same page or flipping a page or two back. Um, whereas in WebDUI, um, you should get into the habit of sort of clicking into those records. Um, when I do that, I'm usually opening them in, in a new tab or new window so I don't have to you know, keep using the back button. Um, I am looking into ways to kind of make that a little more user-friendly in WebDUI, but for now that, that is how it is. So as you can see in this screenshot with the history of Europe and the, the box underneath, um, the hierarchy gives you a sense of not only, you know, this is found at the number for history of Europe, you can also see the, you know, what's above and what's below. Um, if you if you hover over any of those kind of downward facing arrows when you're in Web Dewey, um, what you get is the box at the bottom here that says subdivisions, kind of gives you a, a quick look of what else you'll find there. So say, say something that comes across your desk, it's on the history of Bulgaria. Um, and don't look at the subdivisions box right now, just look at those three digit numbers. It's not immediately apparent where you know, Bulgaria goes, for example. Is it a a neighboring Central European country there with Germany in 943? Is it an Eastern European country with Russia in 947? Um, rather than click through to those, uh, you can check the subdivisions box, which shows you that it is down there with uh, other parts of Europe in 949. So that saves you some clicks um, and is eh, probably would have been a few pages away in print anyway. So there are some advantages. Um, Hovering over things like this can kind of save you some, some clicks, but you should make a habit of checking those, those higher numbers as well. Um, or sometimes down if you're kind of deciding on whether, whether to go to a more specific number or not. Speaking of which, um, there is no real limit to how long a DDC number can be. Um, there is always going to be at least three numbers to the left of the decimal. Uh, but some numbers can get very long to the right. Um, by the way, some, some trivia I like to share, and I think it's in the introduction too. If you're a real math nerd, which I am not, <laughs> um, the decimal in the Dewey Decimal System is not a true decimal. It's really just sort of to help, you know, help us process those better with our eyes. Um, it doesn't work, you know, we don't, add numbers in the sense of, you know, mathematical addition and so on, but a little bit of a side note. Um, impress your friends at Bar Trivia. Um, so when, when you end up with a very long number, it, you're going to be tempted um, most likely to, to truncate that a little bit, um, and, and that's okay. Uh, my recommendation is always in a, a mark record, especially a shared catalog like WorldCat, 
um, provide the most accurate DDC number that you can, regardless of its length or other considerations. Um, but I am also a big proponent of the idea that employees of a library are the ones who best know their own users. Um, that's why I say here, think globally, act locally. Uh, consider your colleagues in libraries around the world. Assume that they want standard DDC as a baseline, but feel free to, to act locally in adapting the system for your needs. Um, if you make a change that you think, ooh, this really does improve upon standard DDC, not just for your users from everyone or for everyone, um, good. Tell me about it. Maybe we'll, we can make it happen. Um, I, I also like saying that there's no Dewey police. You're not gonna get in trouble, especially from me. I don't do you know, unannounced visits to, to audit anyone's Dewey. Um, so whether you want to kind of cut numbers on your own or give kind of local notation, you can consider that a, a sort of tool in your toolbox if that's gonna help you better serve your users. Um, most end users are not going to have knowledge of DDC themselves. They really don't need to. Um, so if, if you ever get someone calling you out on, oh, this is the wrong Dewey number, um, you have someone that really know, knows their, um, either someone who really knows the system or doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, I bring all this up in the context of, of truncating numbers because I know in general there's a, a desire for, for shorter numbers, um, but especially when it gets to number building, you can get to, to pretty long ones. Um, there's a few ways that you can trim numbers for length. First is the idea of close and broad classification. Close classification is kind of the default that says you should assign the most specific number possible to a subject. Um, broad classification is kind of the opposite approach that is happier to use broader numbers for concepts. So my example here is um, income taxes in economics. Um, if you class the uh, work on income taxes at 330, the broadest number, that's not really wrong. Um, and as I will always remember from my first cataloging job, sometimes it's better to stay at a, a broader place, whether that's a you know, classification number or subject heading, um, than potentially go down to the wrong subdivision. Um, I think the rule of three is kind of a, a similar idea to this, that sometimes it's best to just stay at a broader number. Um, I mentioned pretty early on today that there used to be official abridgments of the DDC intended for smaller collections. Um, while there is no longer a separate abridged product, either print or electronic, um, you can see some Dewey numbers still have slashes or what we call segmentation marks. Um, if you don't see those anywhere, there's a preference in the Web Dewey preferences to, to see or hide those as you like. So um, the segmentation mark shows you the place in, in a bridged classification where you would stop. So um, income taxes, you would use just the whole number because there, there are no segmentation marks. Um, but if you had something on corporate income taxes, 0.243, and you were using a bridged classification, you could just lop off that three. Um, again, a true Dewey number is always going to have at least three digits. You will not, never find a, a segmentation mark to the left of the decimal. Um, the segmentation marks are logical places to truncate, but you may choose to kind of use other criteria. It's not uncommon for a library just as a matter of local policy to say, you know, we're never going to go more than X digits past the decimal. Um, in the interests of, you know, fitting neatly onto spine labels or, um, you know, just ease of patron use. Um, and again, I am not against that at all. Um, I'll just ask that, you know, in, in shared, shared catalogs, things like that, um, try to, you know, use full numbers for, for the sake of your colleagues kind of across the field. All right. Um, Coming up next, I have a brief set of exercises to practice um, choosing numbers using some of these rules. So I wanted to once again make these um, temporary counts available. Um, they're also in chat. Uh, if you scroll up a little, and again, if you have if you have your own authorization through your current library, you know it's a good one to use too. Um, for this, this exercise specifically, you'll just be sort of clicking around. So 
I'm pretty sure we'll be in good shape with, with simultaneous users, um, famous last words. So uh, here's your chance to, to jot these down, take a picture, or, or again, you can, can refer to chat. All right, so um, let's see, we're pretty good on time. Um, let's take, take five to 10 minutes to um, look around WebDewey for yourself and try to, to come up with the, the best answers for um, these made up titles, but you know, titles that maybe could be real ones. Um, you, you probably know titles alone aren't necessarily you know, the only consideration when cataloging, but um, in exercises they can be because there's no, there's no table of contents, there's no abstract, there's nothing like that. Um, if it's applicable, you might wanna also think about, you know, how you might shorten these numbers at, at your library. You know, I can't answer that for you. Um, I have the link to the intro there. Um, you know, the, this is certainly an open book. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes and then I'll kind of walk you through these. Um, if you're going through them in order and you know, you're still working on four when I start to show you one, that, that's okay. I hadn't thought about this, but it's also a, a good time for me to um, be more actively monitoring the chat if there's any questions. Um, don't, don't worry if if it uh, feels like there's not enough time. I'll probably start running through these in about a minute. Um, I thought it was better to err on the side of having more examples than not enough. Um, but I, I do want to make sure after we, we do this that uh, there's an, another opportunity to stretch your legs before we get into number building.
All right, I'm going to put these, these four made up titles in the chat um, because I'm going to leave PowerPoint here and um, show you some live, live web duty. All right. Um, full screen. Okay. Um, I'll also hopefully give you a sense of kind of how I, I approach things in Web Dewey um, in bringing these up. So um, I'm a big fan of the browse of the relative index. So for number one, um, And I wrote down the answer. I didn't write down my, my fictional title. Uh, the human intestines and stomach. Uh, my first step is probably going to be look for stomach. Um, there's nothing wrong with a keyword search, but it tends to, you know, retrie retrieve kind of marginal things too. So um, here we go, human anatomy, stomach. I probably could have typed human stomach or something like that. I will click to, to this number. Um, I could make an educated guess that the intestines are also here part of digestive tract organs. So I could either hover over this arrow um, or click, click up to it. I can see the stomach and the intestine. Um, and the rule here is going to be the first of two rule. So answer to number one is 611.33. Um, I'll take the same same approach here for um, for the second example for doctrines, ethics, and education in world religions. Congratulations, Carlin. You got it. Um, hmm. Maybe I should make a note to to do something about that. I'm also going to go page up in the the browse in case it's doctrinal theology is probably a good place for me to start. Yeah, here we go. Here's doctrines. I should have used a keyword. Um, Adrian, I will I will look into that question um, shortly. We'll we'll have our second break soon, and I'll I'll get back to you on that. Um, so if I look further up to where I am. Um, Tried to try to keep these ones pretty straightforward, and um, so we've got doctrines here at two hundred two, uh, religious ethics in two hundred five, um, religious education here in two hundred seven. So um, this is the rule of the rule of three, um, and you could just um, put it here in two hundred. I will take a look at that 612. Um, the, the medicine schedules get into some detail about you know anatomy versus diseases and so on. So um, yeah. Uh, number three for um, complete guide to opera. When there's a title like complete guide, I'm thinking interdisciplinary or comprehensive work. So I will check this. We have it under plural operas. Um, you have an interdisciplinary number here. It's always tempting to see that and think, okay, I'm done. I do recommend that you, you know, click in and kind of check it out. Um, there's a, a manual note here, um, but I can see when I hover over it or cl click into it, this is about other kind of forms of singing. So I feel pretty comfortable in saying for number three um, that 782.1 should do. Uh, finally, number 400, heating with electric chimneys. Um, keyword search is probably okay here. We can't have that much on chimneys. Um, I see, see heating here, so um, there's chimneys also. Um, I'm going to go up here to the sort of, you know, just the three-digit number here for, for heating. Um, something like electric heating I might find under, oh, that's a specific source of energy. Sure enough, if I hover over here or I click in, um, 
got a number for um, electric heating, 697.045. Um, this, is, this is kind of a preview of, of something to come here. Um, this box that says build, the intent is this is for kind of building numbers by hand. Um, you could really put anything in there. You could put your, your grocery shopping list, but in this case, um, I'm gonna put, say one number that I'm thinking about using. And then even when I click to a different one, what I left in that box is still gonna be there. Um, so let's say I wanna kind of hold on to that and go back to my number for chimneys. Here I'm thinking about, okay, 697.8 could do, and the 697.045 could do. This is where the rule of zero comes into play, that we have this zero here compared to in the chimney. This is chimney number, this is not a zero. So I would go with 697.8. Um, I see that suggestion about topics like um, heating in a specific place. Um, yes, that's, that's a very basic part of, I shouldn't say basic, but very common part of number building um, that we'll get to soon. Uh, let me, yeah. Uh, let me go back to my PowerPoint because the, the introduction is going to have a good um, kind of fuller description of how these rules look. Okay, um, all right. I wanna make sure we've got some time for, for number building. So um, let's, let's take another 10 minute break here, but you can um, either now or later explore in the, the introduction, um, which is kind of linked from here. I, you probably can't click on it, but it's you know made to be a nice, simple shortcut. Um, I know people have also pasted links to the introduction and the glossary in, in the chat. Um, and we'll make stuff like that available kind of after the session because um, this is, of course, meant to kind of prime your own work and not necessarily be, you know, we wrap up in an hour and you're an expert. So, um, yeah, let's take another 10 minutes, come back after 11 after the hour. It's afternoon for me, so I, I'm going to get a little snack for myself, um, and we'll see you in uh, about 10 minutes. All right. All right. Um, there was the question about the choice of 611 versus 612 for these um, sort of anatomy works. Um, and thank, thank you, Nora, indeed, in the chat, linking to the, um, the manual note that describes in, in some detail when to prefer one number versus another. Um, th this is maybe exposing the fact that I was just looking for a good example of the first of two rule, um, you know, rather than having a, a real anatomy book in front of me. And um, I'm not knowledgeable enough about the subject to know necessarily um, which of those would apply to this hypothetical title. Um, although the manual note does tell you, um, tell you which one to prefer and it says 612. Um, So that was, um, give a shout out to, to Rebecca Bartlett who came up with that, even though I said the, uh, the 611 number. Um, whenever we have a manual note like that, one number versus another number, the one that comes first is the one that's generally going to be preferred. Um, it's often spelled out, but not necessarily always. All right. For the, the remainder of our time, we'll be discussing built numbers and doing some, some number building of ourselves, um, a lot of which will be over in Web Dewey. Um, I had another slide for those Web Dewey accounts. So I, I think hopefully at this point, um, you all have been using that or your own accounts. Um, th this is the part where when we start to build numbers, I'm, I'm a little afraid that things could get a little wonky with the, the shared authorizations. Um, they can definitely handle some simultaneous users, but um, 
if you're using the, the built-in web GUI number building engine and it starts to um, kind of act up, you might wanna just um, kind of follow along with me instead. So the, um, in addition to the you know, many tens of thousands of numbers that we give you either in print or web GUI um, as possibilities for your works, um, there are lots of opportunities to build more specific numbers. Um, I don't think the number of possible numbers is infinite, but it is very, very large. Um, one of these days, I hope someone can, can run some kind of computer process to, to model those. Um, so if you're cataloging a work and one of the numbers that we've kind of given for you works, good, um, you know, good. Um, but you can also use number building to make more specific numbers to fit whatever you're, you're trying to express. In addition to those, um, you know, tens of thousands of numbers that we give you, there's roughly 12,000 what I'll call building blocks, little components of um, built numbers that you can find in the tables, in addition to some places that kind of let you just build numbers using parts of one schedule number to get added to another. Um, for example, and we'll look in more detail about why this is, you can add 09773 to the end of almost any number to express that topic in Illinois. Given that you can do that for any US state, for any country, um, you can see how just looking at geographic numbers, um, you can get to a truly mind-boggling number of potential build numbers. Um, take care whenever you're building numbers, whether you're doing that completely by hand or using the Web GUI number builder, um, that you are following the instructions that are given in, in how to build in the classification itself. Um, the, the automatic tool does a, a good job of taking those complex instructions and helping build numbers. But um, like any machine, it's not perfect. We've refined it over time, but it's you know, never going to be perfect, perfect. So you should always kind of check its work. Um, again, the, these numbers at the bottom will give you an example of how many potential built numbers can be out there. Um, all right. Um, the tables are the, some of the basic building blocks of built numbers. Um, they're not, you won't always use the tables in number building, but often, often you will. The notation from the tables is never used alone, unlike the, the schedule numbers. Uh, you will always find a base number from, from the DDC schedules um, when you start the number building process. Table one, the standard subdivisions are very similar to, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, free floating subdivisions in LCSH that can be added to kind of anything. The standard subdivisions are, are like that. Um, in the case of table one, unless something tells you otherwise, you can add those numbers. Um, by contrast, for the rest of the tables, you can only add them if you're being told to do so. Um, table two, I know there was the question about kind of geographic treatment, uh, is kind of special in that um, there are a few places that tell you to directly add it, um, but more often you'll be adding table two notation by, by way of the standard subdivisions. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Web GUI here to, to show you what I mean. All right, uh, back in Web GUI, hopefully you can see the, that manual note that I, I was looking into earlier that uh, someone helpfully found. So here is the beginning of table one. If you look on the left here, just where it says standard subdivisions, um, you, you can probably get a general sense of here's our, here are concepts or forms that can apply to almost any topic. There's also a lot of notes here on the right. They also appear at the beginning of table one in print, um, all about how to use them. Um, for now, I'll just highlight a few of the kind of basic principles about using this. Um, again, you can use table one anywhere you want, unless something is telling you not to do so. 
Um, don't use this table notation if it would be redundant. For example, under 01, there is this uh, division 015 for scientific principles that you can use you know, scientific principles of a topic. Um, but if you're already at a science number, don't, you know, there's no need to add that. It's not really expressing anything, anything new. Um, the other, other big caveat to this is once you've added one standard subdivision to a, num a number, you should not do so, or you, sh you should not add a second unless you're being told to do so. Um, if, if you have something that you're cataloging and you really want to express more than one standard subdivision concept, uh, what you should do is, is look at this table of preference that once again, it's in the beginning of table one in print or here in Web Dewey. Um, this is your, your power ranking essentially of all the different um, um, topics that you could express. So, um, you know, if you're working with something that it seems like both management and biography apply, find both topics in here. Management is pretty high, but biography is here almost at the very top. Um, and at the very top of this special topics, I wanna to talk about this specifically because um, special topics is an odd duck. You might be thinking, okay, you generally know what a, you know, serial publications are, education, sure, what is special topics? It kind of, kind of sounds subjective. If you think that, you're right. Um, unlike the other standard subdivisions, um, you should only use this one when it is given somewhere in the, in the schedules. Um, we try to not do this very often anymore, but it's, it's still there in some cases, um, these numbers ending in kind of 04. Um, because this one is so irregular, we do allow you to add another standard subdivision to this, to um, special topics numbers if you want, if it's, a, if it's applicable. Um, and that I think is why it's at the, the beginning here of table one that um, if special topics can apply, you should go for that and then, you know, add further standard subdivisions if you want. Um, again, outside of table one, you need to refer to specific instructions if you want to add other table notation. But table one has a way that lets you fit in notation from some of those other tables. Uh, one of the most common ones of those is found under table 109. You see this covers history, geographic treatment, and biography. Um, you can add 09 to the end of something to just express the history of that. Um, you can add 092 for biography of a person in that field. Um, you know, I know many libraries like to separate the, their biographies in their own section, but if you're using standard Dewey, you, you'll add the 092 to the end. Um, and here in this span 093 to 099 for geographic treatment, there's lots of notes, but the one I really wanna draw your attention to here is to add to the 09 notation from much of table two. Um, so this is how, you know, I used Illinois of course as the convenient example, but how you can kind of express any topic um, geographically. Um, there was the question with heating to, you know, can we represent heating in Germany, heating in Europe? Yes, absolutely, um, by use of kind of 09. Um, got here the subject in North America. One thing that you might use a lot is 0973 is going to be the topic in the United States, and so on. Um, similarly, staying here in table one, we have um, table 108 for groups of people. And there's something similar here for ethnic and national groups, um, which refers to table five, which is a list of ethnic and national groups. So um, this is a chance to express any topic in relation to um, a specific group. Um, I, I'll just hop straight over to an example of that. And um, so here's an example you can see in this box, it's using this standard subdivision 089, and then notation for, for African-Americans from table five. Um, it's also an example of a number that you, you might want to truncate. Um, it's, it's really great, I think, to be able to build these numbers that express so many aspects of a, of a work. The downside to that is that it can result in some very long numbers. 
Um, in, in, the, in this example, um, different parts of the number are expressing the ideas of baseball, of ethnic groups, of Black people, of the United States. Um, and when you're cramming all of that into one number, you get something pretty long usually. Um, from my perspective as an editor, you know, the length of a, a number is not good or bad necessarily, but I can appreciate that um, if you're applying this, especially to spine labels in a practical sense, less is more. So it's um, something that I try to keep in mind when coming up with developments, but there's always gonna, gonna be a trade-off that if you have a, a semantically rich number that's representing a lot of concepts, um, probably won't be that short. So um, this is one of the many thousands of built numbers that are already in Web Dewey. You can see it's denoted by this um, puzzle piece icon. It even spells out built number if you, if you hover over it. Um, using the number building engine that's built into Web Dewey, you can create more. Um, when you create built numbers, you can save them to your account, either at a personal level or institutional level that will be shared with you know, anyone at the same institution as you. Um, those instead of a puzzle piece icon will have a single human figure for a personal number or kind of two human figures um, side by side uh, for the institutional number. If you've saved a built number to your account, you can also um, contribute it, which sends that to me. So along with a team of volunteers, I'll review it. If there's any little corrections, we'll usually make those before um, publishing it so that all web Dewey numbers or all web Dewey users can benefit from that number. Um, kind of like a, a mini world cat for just for DDC numbers. So I wanted to go back and give you an overview of these other tables. Um, you're welcome to explore you know, all of these on, on your own in, in more detail. Um, table two is organized by um, modern geography for the, the most part. So um, you'll get some examples like Hawaii is off in notation with other Pacific islands rather than the continental US. Um, but even though we organize it kind of by geography first rather than political boundaries, all the countries of the world are mentioned there because, you know, th that's how um, that's how works are framed. You're going to get, you know, topic in this place. So, um, if you deal with things um, kind of related to the classics, um, table two three here uh, deals with the ancient world, kind of of classical antiquity. So that is mostly Europe, North Africa, some of Asia. Um, Table two one has um, things like oceans or areas or regions defined by things like um, socioeconomics, um, climate. So um, you can express ideas like the developing world, regions where certain languages predominate, or tropical regions. Um, just as some examples. Um, really any place that you could also make reference to a specific country or county or, or what have you. Um, table three, which comes in in several parts, um, it's mostly used for literature and related disciplines. Um, it is heavy stuff, but I, I believe at least one person here wanted to hear about it. So I do have, I have more to say about that kind of later on. Um, table four is pretty much just used in the 400, 400s for languages. Um, it provides a kind of basic structure of topics that can apply to any language that um, kind of helps provide parallels among numbers for literature. So for example, I'll pull up um, table five, table four, five, the grammar of the standard form of a language. So the number for English grammar is 425, Spanish grammar is 465. Uh, Hindi grammar is 491.435, and in all cases, the five is coming here from table four. Um, talked a little bit about table five already. This is the um, ethnic and national groups. Um, the DDC doesn't have a specific concept of, of race per se, um, and in many cases, we're not really saying what is an ethnic group versus a national group. 
Uh, but there's guidance here at the table at the beginning of table five um, that should help you for if you're trying to express a group of people um, how to choose that. Um, table six parallels table five, um, but describes individual languages. Um, in most cases, the notation is very similar. So, for example, the um, table five notation for Apache people is 9725. And here in table six, 9725 is the Apache language. Um, you might be wondering about the difference between table four and table six, since they both kind of deal with, with language, broadly speaking. Um, the difference is table four is topics that kind of apply to, you know, any language like you know, dictionaries, syntax, language learning textbooks, uh, whereas table six is the languages themselves. Um, I've already kind of shown off when I was showing how to build those um, built numbers, some of the ways just basically how to navigate Web Dewey. Um, the browse I find especially helpful for the index. Uh, by default, you'll get a keyword search that, um, you know, sometimes that's the just the easiest way to deal with what you're doing. Sometimes it gives you a flood of results um, and you'll want to narrow those down by browsing or advanced search. Um, there's lots of uh, different options here in the advanced search that you can use. Also wanted to show off the update feature. By default, this will show you everything that's changed in Web Dewey in the last 30 days. Um, sometimes it takes a minute to load based on how many there are because it will also show you in detail what gets removed, what gets added. Um, additions are kind of highlighted in green and um, subtractions are struck out in red. Um, you can also play with these settings. You can look at kind of all changes. I think this, I don't remember offhand what year this goes back to um, in Web Dewey, but um, you know, you can just see what happened in your since your last login. These, these other periods, you can also give a specific date range. Um, you can also use this kind of notations field. Say you are mostly classifying in a certain area and you just want to know, all right, what changed in the 200s in the last 30 days or in a specific format. You can use both of these dates alone to, um, to check those out. And whatever you use, Web Dewey will remember as your sort of preference um, for the next time you log in. There is a place here under preferences to, to kind of reset this. Um, this is taking a very long time. I, sh I should look into that. Um, all right, I wanted to go back to the slides here. Oh, you probably saw the answers. Uh oh. Um, how are we doing on time? Um, maybe uh, just because there is more I want to get to, especially since um, there's things like kind of language classification, maybe I'll just build a couple of these um, myself and we can, um, if, if you want to, you know, work on some of these on your own. This is kind of good practice. Um, but let me let me at least make um, library administration in Illinois. Totally arbitrary choice on my part. Hopefully, while we work on that, the uh, the updates will show you what they can do. Uh, let's keyword search this. So in the, the context of kind of just storing whatever you want in this box, um, the, this box is um, kind of like just making notes on your own with pen and paper. It's just going to put exactly what you, you put in there. Um, which which you might also find helpful, but I will will show you an example here of um, the automated 
process that you can take advantage of. Um, on kind of any number that is valid to be used as, as a base number, you'll see this box create built number and a button to click start. If there aren't other instructions, by default, the number builder will take you to table one, the standard subdivisions, just because it knows this can be added to anything. Um, if I want to, to express Illinois now, I'll go to the geographic treatment. Um, as a practical matter, the numbers that are going to be added to this are 09, but we really want to go here to 093, 099, um, because that is where the, the add instructions are. Basically, the number builder is going to be reading, reading these instructions, so sometimes it's picky on, on where you need to go. But you can see it's holding the number that we started from, from the other one. It's already got the little human icon, because this is by default going to be an institution, or a personal number, rather. I'll click add. And two things happen. First of all, because we're at the right place, we have these instructions. It's taken us to, um, to this place in table two. Um, it's also added the 09. You can see it's starting to, to put the pieces together. So I could click through you know, to North America and so on to Illinois, but it's also going to hold on to this information I can just do a keyword search. However, I get to the notation for Illinois is going to be fine because it's going to be um, kind of holding in, holding that other stuff in. And when I click add here, this is a good example of why, um, well, it's taken me to another place. There, there is an option to add kind of other things, but um, but th this is what I wanted the, the number for, for library administration in Illinois. Um, see the question about um, find, finding your previously built numbers, um, built or institutional. Um, let's, don't remember offhand. There might not be, but let me look into that. And if I if I find there is one, I can um, kind of send that out afterwards with with the other materials. Um, number building can be can be complicated, but as long as you're paying attention to the individual instructions and along with the number builder, you can you should be fine. Um, you can also use existing built numbers as examples, as long as you're careful about how you use them. So. Um, I'm going to search for Ohio here just to find an example of a built number. This is the perils of a keyword search that it's kind of front loading all these things from table two for all these individual Ohio counties. Oh, here's a, a cheerful example murder, murder trials in Cleveland. Um, looking at these uh, components that make up the number. Um, you know, if you had a murder trial in Chicago, you're probably safe to just sort of, you know, take off this Cleveland notation, add Chicago notation. Um, well, you also want to switch out for Ohio for Illinois, so um, I should pay attention to my own, own advice. Um, but following other examples, as long as you do so carefully, is a, another example of how you can kind of um, make numbers without completely starting from scratch. Um, although personally, I find often the best way to understand what's going on with a built number is to to kind of build it, build it yourself. Um, let's see. So beyond the uh, tables and simple instructions that just tell you, um, bring up an example of this. This is a good example of a, an area that uses direct table two notation rather than using kind of 09. I'm going to hit cancel here so it doesn't keep holding on to this number. Um, but with this span, you can express um, cooking of any particular area. Um, there's a base number 641.59, and notation is directly added from table two 
um, look at this example here uh, with no, no kind of O9 in between. So in addition to um, simple instructions like this, where you're just you know, adding one component um, or using the, the, the six tables to add, um, the other form of number building you're going to run into is what's called internal add tables, um, so-called because they are um, specific to a certain number of the DDC. Um, and in print, they're just printed along kind of with that section. Good example of this is found at 362 to 363. This is for um, social problems and services. The notation you see here on the left with the colons in it um, and on the right is the same. It's just going into more detail here on the right. Um, a standard DDC number is never going to have a colon in it. So what these mean is, um, I'll take an easy example here of the philosophy that this is an 01 that you can add to any number in 362.363 that is marked by an asterisk. Um, it's usually an asterisk in a few other places there, there might be another note. So uh, let me show you an example. I'm going to go to the number for displaced persons and refugees, which is at 362.87. Um, this, the, uh, the dagger or the cross here is pointing to a different thing, but um, the asterisk is your cue that you can add the notation from that table to this base number. Um, so I'm going to say I have a work on material provisions for refugees, things like temporary housing and food. Um, I can go to this, this base number here, click start. Because there's an internal add table involved, um, Web Dewey knows to to go over here first rather than the um, standard subdivisions. In most cases where we have these internal add tables, we will kind of spell out these standard subdivision concepts, um, often because we're kind of um, wanting to add notes or you know, other areas to look for them. Um, in this case, what I wanted was um, kind of material provisions. So down here, there's provision of food, shelter, temporary housing, uh, I can click on this, and once again, you know, this would not be used as a Dewey number on its own, but when I click add, it's going to take the 8.3 from here and add it to my base number. Once again, we, we've gone to table one in case I want to add standard subdivisions, but in this case, this is just um, kind of what I was going for. Um, Uh, yes, you can use um, the comment section to add specific notes that you can limit to yourself or institution um, for, for noting things like uh, local practices. I don't think the comments alone would necessarily find you every previously built local number um, unless you had you know, left a comment on them. Uh, but advanced searching, for example, does let you um, search in comments. Um, you know, if you wanted to put your, your OCLC symbol or something as an institutional comment, that would be a way to sort of collocate those, yeah. All right. Uh, I wanted to show one other big example of an internal ad table. It comes at uh, 9.30 through 9.90. So, um, you, you may notice that most of the 900s, uh, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa, and so on, um, follows table two. Um, and that, that's true. You're, you're really adding to a base number of, of nine from this, you know, 900 history and geography, the table two notation. Um, and that can express, you know, a number like this, history of Europe, history of England, um, is, is one place to start. Um, then from this table, you have other things. You have these things like standard subdivisions. Um, further on, if you're dealing with something for history, you've got things like um, archeology. span um, So I'm going to 
show an example of this. Um, I'll click start. Um, I was at 930 through 990, but it knows you know the real base number here we're starting with is nine. Um, keep things simple. I'm just going to go to the England number and build from here. Um, I don't know why it's, oh, I, I am at the, the 900 number instead of the table two number, so I need to add from there. Um, so once we've got this base number here for the history of England, it's taken us back to this table. I wanted to express something like collected biography. So, you know, uh, look about all the different monarchs of England. Um, I could add this. And once again, it's taking that notation that was after the colon and putting it at the, the end of the base number. Um, I, had, I had some more examples um, using, using these areas, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to move along. And um, when I share out the slides, this will, um, you know, you can use those for, for further practice on your own if you want. Switch back here. And say a few things about um, building with building for literature with the 800s and table three. Okay. Um, it might surprise you to learn that the DDC doesn't have a separate fiction section per se. Um, the 800s is literature, but there's also things like literary criticism that are mixed in there. Um, but my guess is that few, if any of you, fully use the 800s in, in your libraries. Um, if, if you use Dewey numbers for things like, you know, the latest James Patterson novel, um, I'm, I'm kind of impressed because I think most, most libraries are going to use a separate, um, especially for popular fiction, separate section organized by author or genre. And again, there's no Dewey police, nothing wrong with that. Um, it's probably what I would prefer as a, a library user myself. Um, classifying in this area is, is really the most complex area of the DDC, I would say. Um, a deep dive could I, I easily be a, a topic for its own session or two or three. Um, I'll, I have more sources that I can recommend uh, when we send out the resources here to if you want to explore this further. So um, to push this metaphor further, I would not recommend just jumping into the 800s. Um, without the proper equipment and um, preparations. Um, table three is in three sections. Each of those has instructions at the beginning of them. Uh, the 800s, there's, there's notes there at the kind of top of that. Um, in all these places, they're linking to manual notes for, um, for further guidance. There's also very handy flow charts in the manual if you're classifying literature and using table three, um, you can follow those. So um, even if I'm classifying in this area, I probably have several tabs open. Um, I'm not gonna do any live demonstrations of that because it could get ugly. And uh, to really push the metaphor, I you know this is another place where you can look to existing built numbers, your, your fellow divers, as I say, um, as long as you're kind of careful about how you're using those examples. Um, you can also look beyond Web Dewey, look to places like WorldCat or OCLC Classify to see how someone else may have classified something already. Um, it's a good idea to double check their work, but um, can save you from, from starting from scratch. So table three comes in three parts. Um, you will always, if you're using table three, be adding from either A, B, or C. There isn't um, just plain table three notation. Um, in the 800s, you'll most often be using table A, 3A or B, depending on whether you're working with something about an individual author or about uh, multiple authors. In many ways, these are parallel, but table 3B goes into, into more detail. Um, 
Table 3C does get used in part of the 800s, but is more often called for in other areas related to the arts. Um, very broadly speaking, we're talking, you know, fine painting through video games. Um, if you're trying to express um, themes of media, um, uh, you know, nature in landscape painting or um, human emotions in video games, you might be resorting to Table 3C. Um, when you're building in the 800s, there's typically at least three aspects of the work that you'll be expressing. There's the base number um, for the language of the literature, uh, just the original language that it was written in. Um, the DDC separates English language literature of the Americas from uh, you know, other English languages or other English, you know, British English. Um, kind of effectively treating it as its own language, but otherwise you're just going to the first language that something was written in. Um, usually the next notation comes from table 3A or B, depending on if you're at one or multiple authors, um, to express the form, whether that's popular fiction, poetry, drama, and so on. Um, and then there is usually a time period, there's um, specific period tables under different languages of literature um, that in many cases is just kind of centuries, but it might be kind of customized to the area. So um, for American literature in English, the earliest period ends in 1776, another period ends in 1861, and so on. Um, so let me just go back to Ben Dewey and show you an example of this. Um, if you want to get get um, get into really detailed 800s numbers, uh, you might have to do that on your own. Although you are welcome to to reach out for help, search for James Patterson. Um, so this number here, um, deceptively short, maybe for for all that's going into it. Um, you can see the the eight one is expressing that this is American literature. Three, that this is fiction, you know, long form kind of novels. Um, and then the five, four, you can tell from this colon is coming from a table, in this case, a table that shows um, the periods of American literature. Starting with the colonial period, um, here in two, from 2000 on, we're into um, six, but um, we follow the principle of trying to keep a, an author's works all together. So uh, because people like, you know, James Patterson, Stephen King, a lot of uh, big novelists that are still around now started in the, you know, latter half of the 20th century, we're still using the 5-4 the notation for them. Um, all right, given that we only have about 10 minutes left here, um, questions I think can be related to literature and I can dive in on more specifics there if you'd like, um, but I want to get to other questions you may have. Um, there was the one from, from early on about use of or classifying works on COVID. So as you think of other things to ask, I'll kind of work on that. Um, I started with a browse. You could do kind of keyword searches too. Um, we've specifically provided for three different numbers. You can see two of these are built numbers. Um, so let's take a look at the non-built one at first. Um, I don't know if we need to revisit this, but at least at the time we were looking in, in mesh and so on, um, it seemed to make sense to put COVID with um, viral pneumonia because it's a, you know, a disease of the lungs, it's viral in nature. Uh, Diseases in medicine have their own uh, kind of internal ad table. So if you're if you're dealing with a work about COVID kind of in medicine, um, there's lots of things like um, let's see. Experimental medicine for COVID is is something that you might want to build. Um, rehabilitation, kind of coming back from the disease. Um, you can get into a lot of details. Um, if you're working with a medical number. Um, but you might also use something like here in the social services. 
I looked briefly at this, um, you know, social problems and services. There's a lot of medical related stuff in here for, um, you know, things like services to patients that um, are really more about kind of helping the people than necessarily the kind of scientific medical, um, you know, components behind the, the disease. Um, and once again, this is kind of adding from this, um, this table that, that you can get into more detail if you want to express a kind of specific COVID thing. Uh, it's a good question about the uh, link to OPAC button. Um, this is sort of set up in your preferences. Mine is associated with the Library of Congress catalog. Um, and in this case, I'd be surprised if they have anything at this number because it's a newer number and most of their material is in um, Library of Congress classification, of course. So I'm gonna go back here to 813.54. Um, this is basically, if you can see the bottom of my screen, going to the catalog.loc.gov and it's programmed to just sort of plug in this Dewey number and it will automatically open in a new, a new tab. Yeah, with a number like this, it's gonna retrieve a lot. Um, this is configured in your preferences. Um, by default, it's probably going to go to, um, I don't know offhand if LOC is the default for everyone. It probably isn't, but um, we can always work with you if, um, if you're not sure of how to set this up, but you can kind of set whatever the, the search URL would look like for your own OPAC, you can put that in here um, and hopefully have a convenient way when you're thinking about a Dewey number to see what you already have in your collection there. Um, all right, good, yeah, good question about um, posthumous publications. Um, the, the period tables in uh, literature are not necessarily related to when the person lived most often, you know, people are writing while they are alive, and it is going to be based on that. But, um, for example, the uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series um, from, out of Norway, first published in 2005, the author had already um, passed at that point. Um, so that would use the, the notation for uh, 21st century. Um, The question here, though, says author's first publication was posthumous long enough. OK, so um, yeah, there's more detailed guidance in the, in the manual about kind of choosing the, um, the period for someone. Um, but we, we usually try to make it that once, once one place is kind of established that, that other things, other later publications by the person will go there. Um, so the simple answer to your question in that case is, is yes. Um, any other questions? Like I said, I'll send out some, some helpful URLs and, and so on um, when we, we share out the, the slides and recording from this. Um, you are also welcome to, to reach out to me with, with any questions. I'm putting um, a couple of email addresses in the chat. If you ever think, oh, this is too trivial, I can't bother the editor with this, don't think that at all. Feel free um, to reach out. Um, I might have a direct answer for you. I might kind of help you help you see where to look. Um, my, my metaphorical door is open. Chat transcript, I am not sure of. I don't know if um, Nancy or Joy, you have any, any insight into that. What I can certainly do is add um, notes to my slides that, um, you know, I wasn't 100% reading from a script, but I had lots of notes preparing what I wanted to say. So I can um, have those included in the slides so they'll um, stand on, stand together pretty well. Additional online training, good answer or good question. 
Um, OCLC has some uh, kind of free training modules about Dewey. Um, there's general ones. There's ones that go into detail for uh, basically all of the main classes and you know other specific areas like literature. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, we'll try to send that that URL as well out. But um, it talks about like you know use this with an instructor, but um, with with this amount of you know with what you you know now and hopefully other uh, knowledge you may have brought to the table, you can can kind of treat those as as self guided things too. Um, I also teach a course with ALA periodically through the ALA e-learning course uh, series on Dewey. So um, you might see me again there. Um, if we still have time for questions, there's this question about stopping use of edition 23 um, and possibly using something like year accessed. Uh, the short version is that that's already the case, but it's it's pretty new. It was only approved um, earlier this year by the Mark Advisory Committee. Uh, but if you look at the um, Library of Congress documentation pages for Mark format, um, the the short version here is that we realized there wasn't going to be a, a anything that we separately called Edition Twenty Four. What you see here in Web Dewey counts as Twenty Three, same as that that print publication. And that we needed, you know, a more specific way to to cite where you're getting your Dewey numbers from, um, since things change over time. So um, we we took precisely that approach that, um, especially if you're using an electronic format, to um, hopefully get into the habit of citing dates as well as just edition number. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing here, but I'll see if I can quickly find that URL. Um, that explains that change. Um, at least as of right now, the uh, page that I just linked in the chat still has um, kind of changes highlighted in red, so. Hey, Alex, there is another question in chat. Mm -hmm. um, since the DDC online is being continually updated, when will we stop using edition 23 as a notation and maybe use instead something more current like the year access? I think she may be referring to in um, the LCLC mark record. Yes, um, and that should, that should be answered with what I um, have just linked there. Um, okay. Since it's still technically 23, uh, what's recommended is to use the 23, but also additional information such as such as when you accessed it. I apologize if that was what you were answering. It's like I think I was reading the chat. Oh yeah, no problem. I didn't hear what you said, so I apologize. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Because I have 12.01, so it's like we, um, we stayed within our time frame for once. That's a big accomplishment for us. Good, good. So um, last chance. So once again, thank you, Alex. Thank you um, to everyone who attended today's program. Um, it, with this being Friday, um, sometime next week, we should have the recording and I have made a notation to make sure um, that we include the chat transcript because um, I believe that is automatically saved. Um, someone else handles that portion, but um, if it's available, we will make sure that it's included. Um, if not, Richard, you have my phone number and email, just remind me, please. Um, so um, again, thank you everybody.